The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazines. Today, Seascape Painting Secrets with Amory Bowling. You're going to love this one. Hi, my name is Amory Bowling, and welcome to my temporary studio. You might know me more for painting Grand Canyons, but I also like to paint coastal scenes. And today, I'm going to be working on a scene from Malibu. One thing I want to bring up while we're working on this painting is that it's always better to paint with me than to just watch. I mean, there's a lot of information I'm giving out to you, and I want you to be able to commit this to memory. So. We're going to be providing an image for you. You can take a photo of it. You're also able to do a screenshot. However, you can get it off of this video you're watching and into some kind of a tangible object that you can set next to you and work with me. So you can have a video playing and you can have your reference material just like I do. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you know, you're going to be able to get some of the ideas at least working with me. It's going to help this stuff really set in and stick like glue. So I want you all to get the most out of this experience. So I'm going to break down how I paint into some simple steps because I find it easier for me. So I'm going to start with a sketch, you know, tone my canvas, pre-mix a few colors and make it as simple as possible. So let me show you what I've already worked on before starting today and that is going to be a no tan sketch. So a no tan is typically known for being a black and white value study, not really a lot of you know, grays, but um, I mean, this is my version of it, which is a basic value study. And I, putting it up here, it gives me an idea of what's gonna be happening with my values and my layout and my composition before I even start painting. Um, I tend to use markers. Um, these guys I really like, they're by Prismacolor and they kind of come in 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. And I'm able to get like a nice value study without getting lost in color in too much detail. So this is definitely how I start my paintings, especially when I am painting outside and the light changes pretty quickly. So this is the start. We can move on to the next step. Once I get this sketch going, I can start getting ready to paint. Um, I like to work with a toned canvas. I also like to work with a gray palette because I find the white can be a little bit jarring and it makes it harder to mix color. So it's probably not the prettiest way to start a painting, but I just kind of take this like raw umber or burnt umber from, this one's from your acrylic, but it's just like a acrylic paint. So yeah, you can, wait. I don't think I can call that done, but a little bit of humor. Okay, and so then I'm just gonna take my paper towel. I mean, my favorites are like the kind that don't shed too much. So this one does a little bit, but sorry, dip down here a little bit of a little bit of water. <laughs> this is not very not a very glamorous way to start painting. So oh, this is the oil prime canvas. <laughs> I think you can see it separating from it a little bit. I use acrylic because it dries fast. Um, sometimes I'll use an oil wash if I'm outside painting. It depends on my mood. Um, I kind of like it if it sticks around and I don't worry about it rubbing off. So let's get light canvas that has not been gessoed, but it's not really good for the paint. And 
if you've ever tried it, it just soaks right in. So this kind of makes me feel like I'm painting on something a little more natural. So you can, I can see where these are kind of leaving little bits of lint. Not too picky about the edges. So this can dry now, and it won't take very long to do that. Um, the next step I usually start in is going to be putting up some of these lines. As you can see, I brought in some sketches for myself. Um, we have this guy here, which is like the study that I did. I have, you know, I use Photoshop as a program. It's probably a little complicated, I'm not sure, but it works for me. I like working from a computer screen. It has like a good backlight that brings out the colors better. So, you know, I try to have as much utensils and tools to help me be a better painter. So, let's see. This next step, oh, before I forget, <laughs> the no tan, let's bring that up here. Especially if I'm outside painting, I will put lines on this and grid it out so that I can make sure I get everything on the canvas the way I want it to. I'm not doing that today because I kind of have this paper here that already kind of has the lines on it. I'll put it up on Photoshop and that works pretty good for me. So now, I kind of take um, a thin wash of paint. Nothing too crazy for a color. I kind of try to stick with a neutral tone. So this is my um, Cold Gray by Rembrandt, and this is Iron Oxide Red, transparent one. Um, that's probably by Utrecht as well. Um, and then I'm just going to try and match up the lines on my canvas. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it because it's not super large. When I work on paintings that are more 40 by 60, then I'm probably going to be using a ruler because I don't want it to be all screwed up. I like gridding because, you know, it, I find it helps me. I haven't always done it this way. Um, there are definitely times when I started things off a little bit differently, and there was a whole couple of years where I would paint from the middle and then just kind of grow out and I found that one of the problems with that was that I would end up with like you know maybe the canyon would be up here and then everything else would be down here and it'd all be not centered at all so this this works for me and I think half the time when you're painting it's recognizing you know what your handicaps are and what you can do to get around them so for me having a little bit of gritting helps so, yeah, you can kind of see how many I did here. So I started with the center one, add another one in here. Especially now, when you're painting something complicated, which, you know, I tend to enjoy, and I think Malibu Beach has a lot going on, it, it helps to have a good drawing and things placed well. I'm just going to do it like this. It's not perfect, but it'll work. I got a lot of lines here, too. So I probably normally would have this many lines on a um, larger piece. So what I'm going to do now is go on to the next thing, and I'm going to start drawing it out. So you can kind of already see if we go back through some of the steps I've done. I start with my sketch, I tone the canvas, I'm gritting it out, and now I'm going to start drawing. I like breaking things down into basic steps because it makes things a little bit easier and less overwhelming. Um, so I'm going to note here, like just above this line we have this ocean horizon or the, the line for the ocean. I might veer a little bit away from the painting just because, you know, as an artist you can make things how you want it to be. Here, it's always interesting too when you see things on a grid how much our eyes like have a hard time seeing things the way they are. So you, you want to make something in the background look so much bigger than it really is because maybe it made an impression on you. So here we go. I'm going to move this over a little bit more. Here we go. So yeah, when I'm at the studio, I like working from a pretty large computer screen because you feel a little bit more like you're there. I want to emulate being outside as much as I can. So it kind of goes up to here. And then, you know, I'm not going to put in all these buildings. I just kind of want it to be like more of like a pretty hillside, less, um, less people living there. Yeah, this actually goes up higher, and it kind of breaks in here. This is an interesting shape. It's kind of like an elephant rock. I, I like to see if I can recognize 
Like, if I can pinpoint it as, like, ah, it's like an ice cream cone rock, it, it kind of takes me out of, like, trying to paint it for what it is and see it more abstractly. Oh, let me go this. It's kind of that cool little peephole there. What, one thing I, I like painting the seascapes with painting them is that they have interesting color challenges, especially when it comes to grays. Like, painting the green in this color is going to be a good time. Uh, there are definitely paintings I pick just for wanting to try and catch a certain color relationship. So this going down here, we're going to have this rock over here. And this is what I'm doing here is pretty much what I do at my studio. And in some ways what I do outside, I'm a little less rigid about this stuff just because for the sake of time. You know, a plein air painting has a different feel to it. I like those little birds there. I don't know if I'll paint them in because the size of this might make them look a little ticky. A little wave. Waves follow um, the light source too, so you'll see the shadowings that come up here and then the white water here. So I'll get into that a little bit later when we start painting those. Um, let's see. There's some rocks. There's a lot of little rocks going on in here. I don't know if I'm going to paint them all because it can be a little busy. So I might just take some creative licensing and put them where I want them to be. So this kind of goes here. I think these are fun. I, I, I like the glassy look of the waves. You can get them at like this time of day. I'm just marking some shadow right here. So. Let's see, this guy, yeah, see he's really close. This stuff is also handy when you get gritting because these rocks are all at different levels. Like you can see how this guy relates to this and this is lower and then this is the next one down and then this one. And I think when I have students, a lot of times the eye wants to make everything so even. So you'll probably see them line this rock up perfectly with this rock and they'll probably bring this rock down to this level and then you kind of lose depth. So taking your time to observe and please pay attention to how much time I'm spending drawing this out. I'm not blazing through it. I'm trying to be as careful as I can. Um, I think a lot of people want to rush through these steps because they're not exciting. They're not playing with the paint and the color. And then they end up struggling because they're kind of at a loss of what to do next because, you know, they didn't prep enough. Like you need these sketches and these plein air studies and you know a good drawing to make a painting successful and you don't want to miss out on that. But yeah a lot of the time you'll just see them you know start whipping out color which which you know if you find yourself that find if you find with yourself that that's working that's great but if it's not try try this method and see what it does. I've taken, you know, a lot of classes myself and from some really good teachers and I think this is kind of, you know, information I've accumulated over time that I, I like to give back. So, ah, see, see, look, I'm noticing this. This rock is a lot bigger than I want it to be. So I, I think in my eye I see how small it is compared to these rocks, so I'm wanting to paint it small, but it really goes way down here. I mean, I can decide, knowing that, I can decide whether I want to make it a little rock or a big rock, but it's, it, it always fascinates me to see stuff like that, how, how it relates in size to everything else. Sometimes just getting the shadows and the lights in it can also make things look a little less big, so that plays a role too. But you've got to give yourself enough space to add shadows and lights. I love the shadows that come in here too. I think those are super fun. Shadows that go over different things like the, the color of the water and then over the, the white wave and then over beach sand. It'll kind of, you, you'll shift the colors but the values will stay similar. I think that's, that's always a fun thing to do. But that's, that's the artist idea of what, what fun is. I'm sure some of my other friends would think it sounds like torture. We are, we are a weird breed, aren't we? The things we find fun. Like I'm going to stand real still in my studio all day with one arm in the air. I was 
I was in um, San Miguel de Allende recently, and I was talking with a friend, and we were discussing <laughs> artist pain. So you always get like a little bit of tendonitis in the shoulder, just because this is this is your position all the time. And it's always nice to know someone else has the same problems, because you're like, okay, I'm not I'm not crazy. Okay, yeah, it's going way like, way over here. See, this is a big rock. Yeah, as long as as much as I've been painting, it still surprises me how much like my eyes get it wrong. All right, like that. Okay, wait. Uh, yeah, he goes over. See, see, I'm I'm definitely not a perfect painter. Definitely not. One, two, three. <laughs> I I I am always like wow by artists who just like whip it out like it's no big deal and you know I guess that's not me it's fine but half the battle is knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at and what you can do to fudge it so yeah still drying it's like this hmm. am I what is this here 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 okay got it and this goes up yeah this is a little separate rock um, I have painted at Malibu a couple of times. When I go out for shows in LA, it's nice to kind of stop by and visit that beach and paint. I mean, it is California, so there are definitely days I go there and it is crowded and I can't get a parking spot, and that's always a bummer. Um, hmm. Ah, that's where it is. This goes up here. Okay. So. There, I'm trying to think, the first time I went there, I was trying to find this beach, Matador Beach, and because, you know, it's pretty cool. And I ended up at another beach and they were filming some kind of movie. They do that a lot in LA. That was weird. I'm not used to that in Arizona. I mean, I think you have to go to Old Tucson Studios to get in the way of filming. That's California. Okay, eh, something like that. This goes this guy. This guy here. This mass kind of. So yeah, it looks very lovely right now. You can see. I'm sure you're all just dying to do it just like this, but it will make sense later. Hmm. <laughs> Promise. Yeah, look how that rock's interesting. I like the gold colors on it, the shadows. Notice how these curve here. It's not a straight line. It's it's not a you know it's not a square shape. They're very organic. Rocks are also fun to paint. I do enjoy it. I think that's why I like places like Malibu and the Grand Canyon. Is I I enjoy the challenge that comes with rocks and the detail and. It really just speaks to me. I'm going to bring this in here. Kind of really note how these waves turn. They are, they are 3D objects. They require perspective. Um, I think another place people tend to go wrong is, you know, we can block in a blue sky or we may spend a lot of attention doing someone's eyes or something that we find really important in a painting. And then we might slack off in another area. So I have to pay attention to this rock as much as I'm going to pay attention to painting this rock. You can't, you know, it, the whole painting needs to be attentive and well thought out. And one thing I find that helps me is when I start feeling like I'm losing my focus, I will take a break. It also helps me to break them down into steps, like the sketch stage, this stage, maybe mixing some color stages. And I'll take little breaks in between just so I don't, you know, start seeing things through rose-colored glasses or get stuffy. So, you know, another thing, you know, painting all the time, you start coming up with little tricks that make you a little bit better. Okay. A little rock in here. A bunch of little gibberish. I may or may not include it. These, these water lines are really interesting, so I, I've had a lot of fun painting them. Successfully, I don't know. Hopefully today it will be very successful. <laughs> you never know with demos what's going to come out.
I think with any painting, you never really know. Like sometimes you finish one and it's like, I really did a good one on this guy. Of course, you know, next year you look at him like, what was I thinking? But it's always a little bit of a surprise. Okay, we got some, you'll see some reflections like that are going on here in the water. This is going to be kind of like this. All right. So I kind of got things down enough. It looks confusing, but this would be kind of like this stage. And if I'm doing something even larger, I might get into more information, more detail, have a better drawing out. I think because this is a smaller piece, it's a little bit easier to be more relaxed. So um, the brush I was using right now is a Utrecht Rhenish Flat number one. I really like those number one brushes. They're my favorite drawing brushes and I go through them like candy. Um, I also use a lot of rosemary brushes, so you'll see those. The ivory ones are awesome. Um, detail work, these little guys from Utrecht. Um, what I'm going to do now is probably start mixing some colors. So let's do that. I'm going to be using this sketch. Um, I did take a little bit of you know, varnish over it just so I can get it wet again. So if I have a plein air painting or a study I've done, I do my best to kind of get it re-wet again because as a painting dries, it gets a little bit more matte and you want to get it, that wetness back again so you're mixing the proper colors. So, you know, you can use a little bit of retouch varnish. Some artists might use a little bit of oil to go over it and then that will kind of bring it back. And then I'm going to be mixing colors to kind of go with the ones I used here. So this would be the next stage. Um, what I'm going to do now, as, as for me, since I live in Arizona and I don't like to be too wasteful with my paint, um, I like to add a little bit of a blend into my paints. It can also even out the drying time because you'll notice that sometimes on your palette your cadmiums will dry a lot slower than some of your transparent colors. So like your ultramarine blue and your greens will be you know, dried up by tomorrow, especially if you live in the desert like me. So um, I'm going to show you a sample. This, this is a little blend I make. It's kind of in one of those um, shampoo bottles you get at the grocery store, I guess, the travel ones. And it is a mix of, what did you say, like, it's one part clove oil. You know, you can buy them at your Whole Foods store or something like that. And then the rest of it, I just kind of fill up with like four parts or five parts, um, safflower, walnut oil, linseed oil. I think this one right now is safflower oil. So if you can see on my white paint here, I don't want to add too much, and you don't really want to have too much clove oil in it, just kind of a nice balance. This will also give me some viscosity. So now you'll also notice that different paints come with different viscosity, which is like kind of how much flow it has, how malleable. Um, the Utrecht line I think is a little bit thicker, so when it comes to adding oil into it, it's a good thing. So the Sennelier brand is sometimes more viscous. That is wonderful if you're painting outside and I don't have to add oil to it because it will dry faster. Um, I still use a combination of paint, but you know, being aware of how different paints perform helps. So I added that to my white so it won't dry out as fast. It has a little bit more flow and you guys get an idea of how much I will add to a color. Um, some of the cadmiums I'll probably add a little bit less because they don't really dry that quick. And you know, you'll also know by just how thin the paint is how much oil you want to add. You don't want it to turn into a puddle. I'm going to work with my palette knife right now. So let, I kind of did a little bit of pre-mixing, you know, ahead of time just to expedite the process. But you can see over here, I have some puddles of color mixed up. I'm going to edit them a little bit because I can. Um, this is going to be my kind of this rock color. And, you know, feel free to pick whichever color you want to mix first. Like, you can definitely go from, well, I can easily get this sky blue color. Start with that because you can start judging all the other colors you mix off of that. So start with the one that's the easiest and then work to the harder to mix colors. Make it, make it easier. So I'm just going to kind of see how this, let's match it to this guy. So I'm kind of just matching it up to um, what's going on here. I think I can add a little bit more color to this. I mean, I might shift the tone a bit from what I have up here, but 
I'll try to be, you know, a little bit honest. And I'm just adding, I'm making kind of a lilac pile next to it. Um, I think when it comes to mixing color, colors less is more, because if you add too much color, you could just overwhelm what you have. So add increments, and then you can always add more. It's hard to take out. So I'm just making this a prettier gray. The other thing I like to do when I'm pre-mixing is figuring out my shadows and my lights. A um, really wonderful lesson I learned is that everything in the shadow is going to be darker than everything in the light. That's not to say you can't break these rules, but it's better to know them before you start venturing out into the great unknown. Um, don't use it as an excuse to not be a smart painter. So. The good thing about pre-mixing is I can kind of judge ahead of time whether it's falling into a shadow category or a light category. Um, this confuses a lot of people, especially when it comes to things like the ocean or maybe, um, you know, the black house and a white house. So one example I like to use is, even I get confused trying to explain it, is the black house in the shadow versus the white house in the sun? No, the black house in the sun versus the white house in the shadow, yes. So the light color of the black house in the sun, you need to paint a paler, lighter value than the white house in the shadow. I think people see white as being white and they can't get past the local color and see it as a value rather than a light or a dark. Okay, so I'm gonna set this aside. Uh, let me just check what's it doing. So this is of course varnish, so sometimes if I really like the study, I might just, you know, wipe that stuff off when I'm done. But again, this is another thing I learned from a previous workshop. So, hey, I'm saving you money. All right, I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow. I kinda like keeping this like a gray down tone. Um, I think for me, I tend to work in the middle so that I can add lights and darks as I go. I don't wanna be confined at an early stage. Um, this rock, you know, it's getting a little bit closer, so it's a little more warm, so I'm going to grab, this is, that was just some cold gray I had left over. Um, so I'm basically kind of using these tones to get it to the value I want, and then I'm going to start adding warmth to it. So maybe a little bit of cad yellow medium, and this is my perm red medium by Rembrandt, also nice. It's not too pinky of a red, so I can get it warmer. And I can already tell it's getting a little bit warmer than that. This is my transparent iron oxide red. It's another great, great <laughs> way to warm up something. Oh, there's a little rock in there. You can hear it scraping. Okay. See, it's not quite there yet. So if I do this tab, and I can see there, you know, when it comes to color mixing, I ask myself a series of questions. And I think a lot of times you see me painting and you may not hear the voice that goes inside my head. But I'm looking at this little gray note and I'm debating, okay, is it warmer or cooler? Is it too red or too blue? So when I look at this, I see it looks bluer than this. The value looks pretty good, but I really like to see more warm in it. So I think it's lacking some yellows. I think it's lacking some red. So I'm gonna start adding that to my mixture in little pieces, because I don't want to slaughter what I have. I just wanna kind of bring it up to match what I have on my sketch. So, doing a spray. So, and this is a process. This is not the fun part of painting, but you know, by doing this now, it's gonna be a lot quicker when I start putting paint on the canvas. So it's still too cool. A little more yellow, a little more red. I'm, I'm also aware this is probably darkening things up a bit, so I'm gonna add some white here just to kind of keep it from doing that too much. One reason why this rock is a little bit warmer is it is closer to us. It is, I might wipe that off. It is receiving, we're seeing a little bit clearer. There's less atmosphere affecting it. See, it's still, still got a long ways to go. I'm gonna try a little bit of the green. I 
I, I tend to mix, I think, quicker now. Everything, you know, you may start off going, ah, that's getting better. You may start off a little bit on the slow side, but you'll, you'll speed up in time. Don't worry about that. Go, go at a pace that's comfortable for you. All right, now I'm setting that aside. So I have two colors so far. I don't think this means I have to be strict in using these. I might edit them as I go along, but it gives me some nice puddles to work with. Um, okay, so the other colors I really want to try, try and get mixed is like this green value, a light green value, some of this water color here, here, and then there, and this beach color. And then I'll feel like I can start painting because I got some, I got some groundwork put in. Um, since I used a warm color, I'm going to kind of wipe that off my palette. I don't really want this beige tone affecting a clean blue for the sea. This is again some of this. This color I kind of pre-mixed, but it's basically your ultramarine blue and some white, and I might have toned it down with a little bit of cold gray, but I think for this time I didn't. Um, I'm going to add some white to that. Again, I am mixing it up. Yeah, this looks like it's just um, ultramarine and titanium white. Um, another interesting thing to know if you're a new painter is the difference between transparent colors and opaque colors. Um, titanium white is an opaque, and if you use flake white, that would be a transparent. It's good if you're going to work with a transparent palette, so if you don't want your white to overwhelm like your yellow ochre, you might want to work with a flake white. Titanium white is stronger, so, you know, it, it works for me. It's a little more opaque. So you can see I kind of want to get a little, I like this color I had there, so I, I want to be close to this. I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying I need this specific one, but just one that can read as a whole. So I'm going to add a little bit of that red to it just to kind of tone it, a touch of yellow. And again, I'm kind of mixing it over here because it, it doesn't need that much, and I don't want to turn it away from being blue and into something like purple or yellow. That would not work. So yeah, I like adding it in small increments and not, not destroying it. That's just a waste of paint. Okay, again, I can tap it. That's getting a little nicer. I might add a little bit more, some cold gray, a little bit of blue, a little bit of red. Again, I'm kind of mixing my own unique color to mix in with this. Okay, it's getting a little closer. It's a little grayed down. This gives me some room to add lights later, and I kind of like that color back there. I think that's kind of the direction I want to go in. Yeah, I don't really want to get a color mixed up that's going to be the most bold in an area because it doesn't give me any room to work. I can add the highlights and the shadows later and make it exciting. You almost have to like restrain yourself a little bit. Okay. bit more. I kind of like that gray. I'm just going to steal some of that color. All right. I think we're getting close. Again, we do not need perfection. We just need the idea. Oh, you can see the palette knife I use. Um, the biggest thing with buying these palette knives is getting it to fit the right hand if you're right-handed or the left hand. So if you hold it, it should look kind of like this. I like these guys because I can, you know, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with them. Um, I like that I can scrape it up like this, squish it out over here. Sometimes I will do trees with it. I don't know if I'll get to it on this one. All right, so that's going to be my C color. So actually, I'm going to put it up here with the rest of these guys. This is kind of the palette I've gotten so far. I can also see how they're working. This, this one here is going to be in the light family. These are going to be in the dark family. So I can see already this is not darker than these. So that's good. Um, the trickier part will be getting into the greens. Um, I'm going to mix. This color is going to be a snap. Maybe I should do that one. So I already have blue on here, so I'm not too worried about making sure it's spotless. Um, if I were going to make the white water on it, I'd probably clean it up better. So this is, I'm just 10, I'm taking my ultramarine blue. Um, I'm a fan of ultramarine. Like I have three main colors that have to be on my palette at all times. Well, maybe four, because titanium white 
this cad yellow lemon, by Utrecht this permanent red medium, and an ultramarine blue. They're like a really good primary trio. Outside of that, colors can come and go. And for a couple of years, I only painted in three colors so that when I did add something, it was for a good reason. And I think that's a wonderful exercise to try and just see what you can do in three colors. The benefit to it is if you ever go and try to color match like this, you only have like three colors it could possibly be made from. So it makes things a little quicker, which is great. All right, this one, this one is basically just, you know, ultramarine blue and white, so that's pretty easy to mix. All right, let's see. So, basically, you know, it's my painting. I get to mix whatever I want. I'm going to do the sky. The sky looks like a basic one. I put out some, um, what, I don't usually have these two colors on my palette. This one is um, cobalt blue, and this one is Severus blue. I mean, the mainstay is going to be these guys and then the cold gray by Rembrandt. So, you know, for the sake of it, let me go through what I do use so you can write this down unless you have it somewhere else. Um, this is the titanium white. It is by Utrecht. This paint here is cad yellow lemon. It is also by Utrecht. This is cad yellow medium, um, permanent red medium by Rembrandt. This is, oh, quinacrinone rose if I'm saying that right. That one is Utrecht. I'm, I also use different versions of that brand. Um, I think it's a general color. Um, Alizarian Crimson, this one is a Utrecht brand. This is Thalo Green, I believe. Should make sure. I think it's Thalo Green Blue Shade, but this is a Sennelier paint. This is Utrecht Ultramarine Blue. I don't use French Ultramarine. I think it has a little bit of purple in it, and I don't really like that. Um, this, again, is the Cobalt Blue. This is Severus Blue. This is Cold Gray by Rembrandt and Iron Oxide Red Transparent by Utrecht. So eh, there's, my, there's my palette right there, or what I'm using today. So depending on what I'm painting, I might, you know, like for example here, add a little bit more blues because I want more variety. Back to the sky. I'm starting off with some titanium white, a little bit of ultramarine blue. It's pretty, um, the day I'm painting is a little hazy, so it's not going to be super saturated. And you know, I'm also adding a little bit of yellow. But again, if you add just a little bit, it will gray it, not green it. So here it's a little bit of yellow. It gives it some nice atmosphere. And again, just a touch of red. You can see how small amount I'm adding. It's not, a little goes a long way, especially if you're doing really subtle color things. I, I try to take my palette knife on this edge and smash it in like that. I'm not, I see a lot of people who just scoop it up and they end up with this massive amount of red and they just slaughter what they're mixing. So there we go, just a small amount. All right, let's do a little bit more and I can create from that. But see, it's just kind of, it's graying that sky without completely turning it into like a purple or something too specific and a little more red. And again, note, note the time I'm spending mixing colors. I'm not just recklessly, you know, going through stuff. I might, you know, if I'm outside painting, I'll probably have a little bit different approach. I can, I have to work a little bit faster. But I'll still try to pre-mix, you know, some general colors just to give me a bit of a crutch. And especially if you're outside painting and you have light that is turning fast on you. It's, it's great to have these colors out so that you can pull them when the light is gone. Um, another wonderful perk to that, I'm just gonna clean this up a bit. Another perk to actually doing all these steps. So if you're, if you're new to like wanting to be a plein air painter or if you are a studio painter in front of an audience like myself, since I paint out of my gallery, um, this kind of, you know, it gives you a little bit of bumper room. So if, you, if you're a little shy about having people see what you do, I mean, pre-mixing your colors, they're, they're not really watching you paint on the canvas, they're just watching you mix puddles of color up. And then by the time you're done, you know, half of the thinking work is done and you can just like throw it up. So it delays the process. So maybe, maybe that's a great thing. Okay, so 
Got some sky down. The other thing I mentioned I want to do was still like the greens and the beach sand. So I'm going to try mixing some of that up. And again, just to note, I will probably edit these colors as I paint. These are not, these are not set in stone. You know, another color I did not put on my palette that I absolutely love using, I'm going to go get, so give me a second. This is, I have this out all the time, so I, I just forgot it. So this is my CAD, this is, what is it? It's really messy, yellow green, as you can see. I'm, I'm a pretty tidy painter, so believe it or not, watch me eat my words today. Um, I like this color because it just kind of, um, it's, I use it more as a kill color. So for this beach sand, you know, it, it can make some pretty neat stuff. It's not so green that it will turn everything green, but you can see with this color, it's just kind of giving it a nice, warm, buttery gray. Now, the other thing I want to do is mixing this beach sand color or mixing any color on a painting, it helps to note what your darkest dark is going to be and what your lightest light is going to be. And you can see here it's pretty dark and here it's probably going to be dark, which is like the dark rocks and the shadows of the dark rocks. The lightest light in this painting is going to be the waves. So if you make your sky up here too close to white, or if you make this beach sand too close to the white of the waves, the waves are not going to pop and they're just going to kind of look flat. So appreciate the colors you're mixing and especially as I start making that white color for the waves I'm going to be judging how it works next to these other ones so that it stays the lightest light. I don't want it, I want it to stand out and not just look like every other color I've mixed. Each color needs to be unique. Okay. Let's see how this is looking. That's a little light. Let's get this. I'm going to add a little bit more red and green. So again, this is the permanent red and a little bit of that yellow green. Well, I got a little mud in there, but I don't think I mind it. Again, it's a nice going for that middle value. I could probably warm that up a bit. Again, see how careful I am about not adding too much to it. Hopefully I'm mixing enough. That's another thing you have to make sure. Mix enough paint. Um, let's see. Let's see, and all you probably thought painting was easy. This is, this is a little bit of a challenge. Makes it fun. I mean, if it was a snap, I mean, I would probably bore of it and do something else. There's always something new you're learning. Um, there's always something you haven't painted yet. There's always things you're not very good at painting, but you keep trying, and then one day you might get it. I mean, I think my, my Achilles heel is definitely like green. Green trees, green grass. I'm not used to that stuff. So, you know, being in Arizona, and I think in California, so much of the greens you get are, are like bluer or like gray or like in, in the desert, it's very olive. So. I go out to something like Vermont in the spring and I am just, I think it just looks terrible. All right, I painted up in, um, I was on a painting trip and I went to Glacier and we were up by um, one of the Logan's Pass. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have been up by Logan's Pass, but it, it looks like a fairy tale book. You have like green grass, like flowers everywhere and like these fluffy white goats that could almost be unicorns. And you try, you try to do a painting like that and you just feel ridiculous because it's like, oh my gosh, I just did a fairy princess painting and there's so much green everywhere and it's hard. I'm so used to painting like rocks and oranges and blues to like do something like that. I, I can't. So one day, one day I will tackle it and it will, it will succeed and I won't feel silly. Okay, I'm just going to mix up a little bit of um, that white ocean color. So because I'm mixing... Uh, a pretty pale, easily influenced color. I'm just going to wipe this clean so I do not end up with, you know, a green ocean or a green sea foam. So, I mean, I'm not saying I haven't done it before, but it's very rare if I just pull straight titanium white out and use it. I'm also going to think of like 
complementary colors are going to pop a little bit more. So I, I've got the C color, this kind of blue-gray C color. So I know if I make it a little bit different, it's going to show up more. So I'm adding a touch of cad yellow medium to this just to tone the white. So it's going to react more with that blue and be more exciting. Ah, see that? That was too much. A little goes a long way. I mean, actually, I'll probably say this because I use it as a highlight on some of these rocks. I can add some darker. Let's put that aside. I, I, I do my own mistakes, too. So let's get that where I want it. And, oh, another really important tip for painters. Um, make sure you have enough palette or enough paint on your palette. Because if you start running out of a color, like if I start, I've seen students who run out of like a yellow and you know, because they had a good idea in their head, they don't want to go back down and pull out another color, so they just start using the wrong yellow. And then they lose their painting, and that's, that's a tragedy. So, you know, I had a teacher, um, he always said, paint like a millionaire. And, you know, it makes good sense. So mix some of this into it so that you can paint like a millionaire and not have your paint dry out tomorrow if that's, if that's something you're worried about. This is my ocean color. I can see how it's, oh yeah, good. I'm like, oh gosh, how's it reacting to that? It's lighter than these guys, which is great. This is also a light value, and it is reading lighter than my darks. That is awesome. Um, so let's see, you can bring over the C color and see how they handle each other. I might even shift this a little bit more to make it more interesting as I go. Let's see. I could probably lighten that up a bit. Brighten this guy up some more. Just things you do to kind of see how these guys are playing with each other before I get it up on the palette. I'm going to add some of this quinacridone rose. Quinacridone. You know, writing out your supply list is like a spelling bee challenge because, you know, I, I recognize I say everything completely wrong. And then I try to spell it out phonetically. I'm like, oh, I know that's not right. I don't know what it is. Phthalo, Cudacridone. I should look that up. I can do raw umber. That's easy. Okay. Green. Stay with me. You're doing, you guys are doing great. I wonder if any of you guys are actually painting with me while I do that. That'd be kind of cool. I'd want to see what those things turn out like. All right. So kind of just getting the value up for my green. A little bit of gray. Now I do recognize that the green in the distance is going to be a little bit cooler. It's a little bit further away. And the one up close is going to have more warmth in it. So let's see. It's looking a little electric right now. Okay. It's gray. Let's gray this sucker. Whoa, too much. I'm really just kind of thinking out loud here. So I probably, this is my inner, running inner dialogue. Like I know this is completely wrong. Oh, whoa, that's not too bad. Go figure, a little bit darker. You never know. Okay. The gray palette also helps like you know, you think this is a very light color, but when you put it up here, it's, it's not. I'm going to add a little, I want it to be, have a little bit more yellow to match the color I have up there. So I'm going to go for the warmer yellow because I think it has a bit more red tones in it than that pale. So, you know, again, when it comes to color mixing, I'm really asking myself a series of Q and A. Is it red enough? Is it blue enough? Is it too dark or is it too light? Okay, that's looking pretty close. Add a little bit of red to it, a little bit of yellow. A little bit of this yellow. Okay. Usually I have music in my studio, so I could start singing. I'll try, I'll try to make a playlist that fits what I'm working on. If I try to do something moody, though, I think people will come into the studio and they're like, why are you playing such depressing music? I'm like, but it's a, it's a moody painting. It's a stormy scene. Whatever works. 
Okay, so I'm making this green. This is going to be a green a little bit closer to me. It's going to be a little bit more rich. All right. Let's see, a little too much. I got a lot of this guy here, so I'm just going to borrow some of it. Okay, this is some of that phthalo green. I'm very careful about using it. It's a powerful color and, you know, it, it, I kind of use it to tone things or make shadow colors and a little goes a long way or you're just going to get up with, you know, something really, so it needs a little bit more, a little more green to it, a little too much red. Maybe I'll borrow some of this guy. All right, I'm going to put this here for now. So you can see I got quite the next palette going. And I try to keep, you know, an area in the middle clean so I can work. Ah, that wasn't supposed to happen. It's fixable. There, right there, like that. All good. I might mix up a little dark color too. I guess I'm on a roll. Um, ooh, let's make a dark rock color. So I'm kind of doing the ultramarine blue and the transparent iron oxide red because in a way they neutral each other out. <laughs> All right, how's that looking? You'd be surprised how not super black some of these things are. It's a lot more high key than you would expect. I just don't want it to look green. I'm going for a warmer color. A gray, everything is a gray color, I guess, like a gray blue, a gray green, a gray, gray rock. We artists love grays. That's like everything. It's fine because you, I like, I was discussing with, I think, Eric the other day, the, the fun of the gambling grays. They have a lot of interesting stuff out there. I like the weird, I, I, I'm finding, I don't always use them so much, but they're cool. Okay, I got it a little too hot, so I'm cooling it off a bit. And I'm not too concerned about getting this color perfect. That should do for now. Again, these are all editable. It's like a tongue twister. Editable, editable, edible. <laughs> these colors are all edible. Ugh flavored. This is blueberry. This is mint. Okay, let's see. So in my world of painting, this would be my next break. So I do try to take the little breaks again, just so I can keep my head clear and not be overwhelmed with such a big task because it is sometimes, oh my gosh, it's a whole seascape. I'm overwhelmed having it broken down into little pieces, like all I have to worry about right now is making a sketch. All I have to worry about right now is drawing it. All I have to worry about right now is just mixing some colors. So now I can say, all I have to worry about now is just putting paint on the canvas and not like the whole kit and caboodle, which I think can easily overwhelm you. The sea. The sea has been inspiring artists since the beginning of time. Artists like Turner, Sargent, Monet, and Sorolla. Seascapes are magical scenes, a true testament to nature's wonder, and full of limitless opportunity for beginner and experienced painters alike. They say that an artist has arrived when he or she has mastered the sea. That's why great seascape painters never go hungry. In the all-new Seascape Painting Secrets video training collection, master painter Amory Bowling guides you through the step-by-step -step process of painting a gorgeous seascape. If you're tired of seascapes lacking life and emotion, or if you've never tried it, now you can get it right from the beginning. 
without the awkward struggle of trying to chase moving waves and water. It's always better to paint with me than to just watch. I mean, there's a lot of information I'm giving out to you and I want you to be able to commit this to memory. So we're gonna be providing an image for you. You can take a photo of it. You're also able to do a screenshot. However, you can get it off of this video you're watching and into some kind of a tangible object that you can set next to you and work with me. So you can have a video playing and you can have your reference material just like I do. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you know, you're gonna be able to get some of the ideas at least working with me, it's gonna help this stuff really set in and stick like glue. You'll discover the secrets to painting sand, rocks, crashing and rolling waves, and reflections on the water. Tips and tricks to working with light and shadow. So if I were to have a scale like this, let's say my dark is here, right? And let's say my white is here. Let's say this is the middle point where there's no man's land. All your shadows are gonna be in this side. All your lights are gonna be in this side. Amory will not only show you the step-by-step -step process of a painting from beginning to end, she will demonstrate small steps that give you a big advantage. This is gonna tease that area. Very light-handed brushwork. I'm using the point like this. as opposed to when I was scrubbing the water and I'm taking this side of the brush and I'm just scrubbing it in like this. And then sometimes you'll see me do this when I wanna be really like square about my brush shape. It's not just about painting what you see, it's about creating the emotion you feel when you visit the sea and how to capture that in your painting. Amory Bowling is a talented instructor with a gift for breaking down the painting process so that it's both easy and fun. You'll have hours of enjoyment, and knowing these techniques will make your seascape paintings come alive. You could spend decades and hundreds of hours trying to master the sea, or you can let Amory Bowling share what took her years to learn. Seascape Painting Secrets is now available on DVD and streaming video. Order yours today and start painting amazing seascapes tomorrow. That was Amory Bowling and Seascape Painting Secrets, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. And remember, there's a special discount hiding out in the comments section. Be sure to look for that. In the meantime, let's get right to the interview with Amory. Hey everybody, I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine, and today we have a very special artist with us, Amory Bowling. Welcome. Thank you. It's exciting well, this, to be here. Yeah, we're <laughs> glad you're here. So this is, uh, this is kind of cool for you because your career is just soaring. Uh, you've That's really become <laughs> popular and uh, it looks like you're probably selling a lot of paintings. I've been very lucky so far, so I hope it continues. You know, I, I tend to think that people who are lucky make their own luck. True. What yeah. do you think? No, there's work that goes behind it. It's definitely not, you know, just sitting around and crossing your fingers that good things will come your way. You have to kind of go out and get it yourself. So I sense from talking to you off camera that you're a bit entrepreneurial. Well, I... Um, both my mom and dad were entrepreneurs, so they both started their own company and did very well, and then they sold it, and my sister's in that business. So I come from that kind of mentality or background of, like, do it yourself. So that probably seems a lot more natural to me. So Yeah, well, I, I would think so, because if you're around entrepreneurial parents, you hear things and it just starts happening through osmosis. Yeah, and, you know, even in college when I was taking you know, classes I would do a little bit more like I wanted to be in galleries, so I tried to get in and failed. And so then I found a way to have my own art show. So I found a venue, I did my own advertising, I wrote press releases and got slides made. And I don't think a lot of the other students were doing that, but I think it just seemed like, oh, that's what you do. That's how well, you I make things you happen. I hope you got an A. 
I did actually. I think I don't know if, if I'm allowed to say it, but the teacher said that since I was doing that, he would give me an A for the class. But I mean, I was also doing everything I needed to do for the workshop, or the not the workshop, the the class I was taking. So I, I liked art. So doing anything for a class was a good thing. I think that uh, I grew up. My dad was an entrepreneur, still is, at, night, at almost 90. And I grew up watching him start businesses and take risks. And so I just naturally do that. And, and I think that you're probably doing the same thing in the sense that a lot, of, a lot of people who don't grow up with that are afraid to take that leap and start their own business. And you have an art gallery. I do, yeah, that was a scary thing to do because I had been working out of my house and there's safety in that because you're not worried about the expense of paying rent, but you know, it's also hard because you're hoping the galleries see in you what you see in yourself and you know, when you're new and starting, that's not always the case. So, you know, I was doing what I could to, you know, participate with the magazines and do advertising, but I also found that, okay, maybe, since I don't really have a good representation in Scottsdale, I can have my own place, and it would also be a, where I could go work, because at that time I was working in my dining room and it wasn't ideal. So I found a space on Main Street, so I had you know relevant foot traffic, um, a good location, the rent was reasonable, and started painting in there, and I think the quality of, <laughs> the qual the quality of my work really went up because I had nothing else to do but paint. It wasn't like I could go wash dishes or hang out in my bedroom or goof off. Like There really wasn't anything else than painting and it made my work look better and more finished and more focused. So you took the distractions away because when yeah. you're at home you could have an excuse to... Do pretty much anything else. Right. Wake up late. I mean I there are people that you get visiting the gallery but it's kind of like it's relevant distractions, you know, they're coming to look at art or they're interested in what you're doing or they're here to buy, which is always good. And you know, it's not constant, so I still found that easier. You used a term, you mentioned, just mentioned relevant. Yeah. You said relevant foot traffic. <laughs> uh, I've never heard that term. I'm a marketing guy, but uh, I like it. Tell, I thought tell, that was a, the best tip I ever got from a friend. Tell us about it. Um, he, I was talking about, well, he had opened his own gallery and studio, and he was saying, you got to do this, like, so-and-so did this, and he's super successful, too, now, and you got to do it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, how do you make rent, and then da-da-da, and then he, one of the things he told me is, make sure when you get a place, you get something with relevant foot traffic, which was good, because it really helped narrowing it down, because, you know, I remember there was this one spot in Phoenix that was, like, right next to a coffee shop that I liked. It was kind of a cool space. It was downtown. There was probably only offices and a school around it, but I'm like, oh, that'd be great. I'll just paint and go get coffee. It'll be fun. But I wouldn't have sold anything. Right. I would have no liked art buyers, be, right? There was no one going there to buy art. I didn't really, no one knew who I was. So going to Scottsdale, it was kind of like, you didn't really have to, you know, have a name because you had it on the building and that kind of just made people think, whoa, she's, she's somebody. She has her name on a sign and a door. And so then they'd come in, they're like, oh, I like this work. Let's buy it. So. And Relevant is all about all the people on the street are yeah. shopping for art. People come to Main Street in Scottsdale to buy art. Like that, it's an art hub. Like there's the Scottsdale Artist School I teach down the street. You got students who are able to visit you. You have art buyers visiting you. You have your local community who want just to have like an artistic outing. So you get all of that on this one street. And I probably wouldn't have had it if I just opened it up in an office building or something like that. So, well, let's back up and talk about how this all began. Uh, you're very successful for your age, I believe. Oh, thank you. And you're you're still very young and. <laughs> Uh, how long have you been painting? I have been painting since I can remember. So, yeah, I don't have a time when I could say, when I was 10 years old, I discovered art. It just, it was like, it was very innate. Not to say that I was doing a great job, but I think it relaxed me or it was a way for me to focus. So, you know, school and homework papers and free time was pretty much spent drawing or doodling and 
it was also my identity growing up as I was the artist. So I don't think I was planning to be an artist when I grew up, but it was definitely what I was going to be because it was all I did. It just, I didn't really think of it that way. It was like, oh, I breathe and I walk and I draw. So, yeah, I ended up... So was there a time when all of a sudden it clicked that said, all right, I need to get some really good instruction or... Or, or are you completely self-taught? What's no, that no. I, I don't think I could say self-motivated. I think to say self-taught is like I got a lot of great, you know, painting tips from people I've taken workshops from. And I started going to the Scottsdale Art School when I was 16. So I think Bob Bob Shoefly was my first teacher, and I was like diehard pencil artist. So I took his class. And then I kind of moved on to, you know, I took a lot of classes from Joseph Mendez and Scott Christensen and I had really good instruction from them and I learned so much. So I can't really say I learned those all on my own. Oh, well, how fortunate to live in a place with such a great yes, school. I'm very lucky. So I was able to kind of go there and that, that's how I spent like spring breaks in high school and college is going back to take a workshop or I might take time off of school for a class. So... But yeah, I think then I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to college. And at first I thought I was going to be like, I, I was still young, so I had this romantic notion I was going to be like Egyptologist. Like, that sounds exciting. And then An I found... Egyptologist. <laughs> I was, you know, when you're young, you have all these ideas like, this is what I'm going to be. And it's not, I don't think it was that realistic for me. Because I, I took those classes. And first off, I'm going to the University of Arizona, which it's a good college, but I don't think, I don't know if that's the school for Egyptology. I didn't really do my homework, so I, I took a class, and then the instructor was very good, and he basically laid out the reality of what you were probably going to be doing, which was paperwork and massive amounts of studying you have to do to find out if there was even a dig you could do, then find the funding. And I'd probably just be digging up pottery off of, you know, the freeway in Tucson. I was well, like, sounds- no, I'm going to be an art major. Sounds very exotic. Uh, it until do- you actually stop so and think like, about it, okay, I'm just right off the, my whole life I think it's dusting the I-10, dirt. digging for pots. So yeah, then I, I went and full time art major after that. So yeah, <laughs> that was like my turning point. And, and when did you become a professional? When did you first sell your first painting? First painting. Um, well, I mean, I, I sold a painting to like a hairdresser when I was in high school. I don't know if that counts, but. Sure. Um, I went to work, out of college, it was like, you got to get a job, and it's like, okay. So I went to work at like a, one of those places that make lots of art, and you'll probably find them in your hotels or Z Gallery or Ethan Allen. So I was one of the artists that worked there, and I did good, and I thought it was a great place to be if you wanted to kind of have a steady paycheck as an artist or have insurance but at the same time you weren't really able to just go off and do your own thing so, so is this like a company that that creates things that go in those stores is yeah that- basically and you could also be a private buyer that would buy stuff but you know you made a lot you you made a lot of work and you sold it and it was nice but like i think it wasn't really what i wanted to do and there was a lot of artists i think in that facility that wanted to be able to like break out on their own and be an artist for their for themselves so I quit. So they were telling you what to paint? In a way. They would give you direction. I mean, I had some creativity, but, you know, there was like, okay, this is, this is the style we need you to work with because we don't, like, I could do figures, so they didn't have someone that could do that. And so if you could draw, that was a valuable thing. So I had my niche, and it was fun. I liked it. I always thought that, okay, if, if art fails, like this is a thing to go back to because at least I can, you know, still do art. But I have a lot more fun discovering who I am as an artist outside of it because I have more places to go and better quality of materials. I can use oil paints and, you know, be a landscape painter, I guess. So. So is that what you consider yourself? A I'm landscape kinda, yeah. Painter? I mean, I, I like figures in it every now and then. I don't think I'll ever be like. A figure painter or a portrait painter. I try and I always think they look goofy, but I do like it when I'm able to have like a figure incorporated into a landscape 
Well, you do those beautifully. Yeah, those are kind of fun. <laughs> if you look at your website, you've got a lot of them. You've got some horses. Yeah. And, and I like to get to know the people I paint, so they're all, I know them. And so I, I, it's weird because sometimes they're the ones who buy those paintings, and I feel bad because I don't want them to think that the purpose of me painting it was to make money on, off of them. So I, I do try to do thank yous, like I'll give them a book or a print or something like that. But... It's fun to get to know them because a lot of them, you know, work at the canyon and it's hard when they move on and, you know, find a job at a different park and I don't get to see them when I go up. But Well, you, you do a lot of canyon, Grand Canyon paintings. I love it. Uh, how did this passion for the Grand Canyon happen? Um, you know, I think it's a combination of things. There was, you know, you always, you know, when you're starting out painting, there's always like the advice someone might give you, like, mm, you don't want to paint the canyon, it's too hard, don't do it, don't go. And so I think I have a little bit of a rebellious quality that says, oh, don't go paint that. Well, it's exactly what I want to do. So I was coming back from painting at Monument Valley in Canyon de Chez, and there was a turnoff to the North Rim. I think it was in October. So took the turnoff and drove to the North Rim, which was, you know, from there, like maybe a four-hour drive. And it was the end of the season, the last night the park was open. And got very lucky and got a really good hotel room. And I got to paint there for, you know, that one night. And I thought it was really great. I got some not that good pictures because back then I was still using 35 millimeter. Right. The dark days of plein air painting when, you know, you get your photo reference material and you had no idea what you were taking pictures of. You just snap, 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 snap. And then, like, you get home and then you would have it developed on the dark side and on the light side and on the medium side. And like, I got two photos from four rolls of film. So then it's like, well, I gotta go back, get more material. And so I went back, kept going back. And then I saw like a, it was a Clark Hollings painting of the mule train going down a snowy trail at the canyon. Mm. And I didn't know enough about the canyon to have an idea of where the trail was. I thought it was the Bright Angel Trail at the South Rim, so I would stalk it out and get there and just wait for the mules to come up. And I was like, <laughs> any minute now. And I'd have to do it in winter because his painting was in the snow. And so I would like freeze and stand there and stand there and waiting for those mules. And eventually I started to get to know the people who worked with the trail crew in the National Park. And they, you know, also really great people. And I think there was one that's like, you know, if you just... You know, because I think I was sitting in a snowdrift once for like a couple of hours. Oh. And I, I pulled the car mat out of the car seat to sit on because I wanted to get a picture of them going across the train tracks. And he was like, you know, we'll just give you our number and you can call me so that you don't have to wait so long. <laughs> and then... Well, that's nice. But yeah, I ended up finding out that it was never Bright Angel Trailhead. It was a Kaibab Trail that uh, they had come up. But I just didn't know the canyon well enough back then, so... Well, tell me about photography. You use a lot of photography? I do. I, um, I appreciate a good digital camera. I currently use a Canon Digital Rebel and probably on my third one because I bang them up quite a bit. Um, <laughs> the iPhones or the camera phones are getting better so I've been kind of using both of them because the iPhone can kind of get a better balance of light and dark than I think my digital can, maybe because I don't know how to properly use it. Well, the iPhone has HDR in yes, it. Yes, I do which like will, that. Which basically, <laughs> for evens people it who out. don't know, mm -hmm. you're, you're either getting exposure for the sky yes. or exposure for the land, and so it takes multiple exposures and then mm -hmm. combines them. So, yeah, that that's very handy. So I'll get the detail from the digital and then the nice color balance from the phone and... I think when you bring the study home from painting outside, you get, like, the more information, the better for me. So I have this digital image that I can use as a drawing reference, and then I have my plein air sketch to use as a color study. And also, just the whole, like, vibe of when you're there, you can't really get from a photo alone. Like, it's a little Glad sterile. Glad to hear you say that. So, and I think that's an important distinction, because yeah. painting from photographs alone without having the experience of painting outdoors and, and really being able to capture the light because photographs lie, right? They, they do. They distort nice things. They, didn't. they make the shadows darker. The, the colors are not often as vibrant. And it's but, a world in a, a little box like or whatever screen you're using from. There's, there's no spirit of the place in a photo. It's just flat. So you can't really feel like what inspired you to paint it was what you felt when you were actually there on location, not, right. not the photograph. Right. But. 
So you try to do a plein air study when you when you go out first. We're, I mean, I'm sure there's some exception somewhere, but if I'm painting something, I painted it in person. So I don't really, and if I can feel like if I've been in the studio too long and I haven't been outside, you just get that staleness that creeps in. It's like you got to go back there. So a lot of people viewing this might not have ever experienced plein air painting. Yeah. Um, Tell me about the first time you actually took it outdoors. That's a good one. I, it was definitely, you know, uh, I was in a, that was in a, a Joseph Mendez class. And I, I was still like just, you know, finishing up being at the art group. And I was like die hard photo. I'm like, you don't need to paint outside. I have these, you know, crappy photos to work from. And they're the truth. Because like, I, I didn't know. It looked like the truth to me. And so I, I came into this like class. It was a workshop at the Scottsdale Art School, and I had my my photograph there. And then I had like something very similar in front of me. And then that you know he had come up and he, he pointed out like, do you really think it's this black? And then he's like, look at this still life, and look at the difference between the still life and this photo you have. And you know, first you know I'm sure I've heard it before, but for some reason it really clicked. And I was like, oh oh crap, yeah, it's completely different. Like that <laughs> that. That still life I, is not black. It's in, it was a light bulb, and you know, I got myself like out there. I took well, not right away. I took the Ray Roberts class, and that was a plein air painting class, and that was my first one. And I was very ill prepared. I came out with like I think a halter top, so I could get some color. I had um, a rainbow umbrella, which made all sorts of awful colors. And <laughs> Projected different colors. Yeah, and then canvas. you're very nervous because like anything that approached you, you were sure was going to critique what you were doing. And, you know, I, I was probably pretty bad because I haven't painted outside before. So it's so like people, focusing What things. would you tell people who have not done plein air painting? What would you tell them to do? And, and what, what's your step-by-step -step recommendation? Um, I think getting... I don't know if I would say courage or just accepting that, you know, the first times you go out there, it's intimidating and it's normal and you're, we're all going to kind of go through it. It's, it's okay. And, you know, you can go with a group if you want, if it makes you feel better. Sometimes that was easier for me. Like taking the workshop, I think, made a little braver because you're with other people who are similar. And, and, you know, I know even though I know that even with that, I have had students who are afraid of taking plenary workshops because they don't think they're good enough. And, so many workshops, I think, or painting outside is, is tailored for your level. Like, you do what you can, and even if all you do is get out there, set your work up, and do a little sketch, like, that's great. You made a first step, and then maybe you go a little bit further next time. Well, you, you would probably recommend to someone that they, sh they should learn painting before they actually go out and try to do Oh, painting. well, yeah, you can work on, um, I mean, most of what I did before that was, you know, still lifes, and, well, I did a lot of photography work, but... You can paint just like, you know, a simple apple or, you know, an apple maybe in one painting and a plant in another can be many other things in the landscape. Like maybe it's a red door when you're outside, but you'll learn just as much from those, the little yeah, objects. Yeah, well, you know, there's so much information. Um, I was with Joe McGurl, mm -hmm. and he said, I can paint figures in my sleep. He said, landscapes are tough because... You're really doing hundreds of little still lifes, yeah. you know, with all the shapes and all the trees and all the reflections and all the water. And all, so if you, you know, make the, that branch a little off, nobody's going to know. That's true. Yeah. Like the eye, just a little bit off of the eye, and it's like, oh, they look goofy. <laughs> goofy. <laughs> well, I, I think that um, I, I think it's an interesting thing for people to go out and. And, and get the opportunity yeah. to paint. It's scary, on, on but it's so worth it, and it's so much fun. Once you get over that initial fear, like yes, be have some experience under you. Like get a good setup, um, get comfortable with the paint. You know, take a workshop if you need to. But it's so worth it when you get out there because it just makes your work better. It's more true. Your colors will be better. And you'll be happy. Yeah, I, I think it's great advice for people because um, you know the great art schools. Um, in Russia, for instance, yeah. which are probably the best in the world. They teach figurative art, they teach anatomy, mm -hmm. but they also teach plein air painting because they say that you really can't learn how to no. paint unless you get the real sense of color, and you can't get that from a photograph. can't. 
I mean, yeah, it'd be nice if you could, but you can't. And you know, it probably actually probably wouldn't be nice because then you'd miss all the fun and the adventure of yeah. painting from life. Even if you do a bad job, it's still fun. Well, for me, I, I can't speak for you, but I think that <laughs> plein air painting for me, and I call it the new golf uh -huh. because uh, I, I think it's challenging. It's a workout. Uh, it's a chance to be outside, a chance to hike in a little bit. You're still getting your creative uh, juices flowing. And then, you know, some of us get yeah. lucky and have the ability to sell our paintings, which even makes it even better. But I, I just love going outside. And, yeah. and, you know, I'm not a sports guy. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to hike, you know, hundreds of miles. But yeah, I, I like to be able that. to pull up the car to the side of the road and set up and be in a beautiful place. And, Sometimes I think if it wasn't for painting, like the me by nature would not be like, let's go camping, let's go hiking. But if it involves a good painting, like I'm all in. So, so do you camp? Yeah, I camped. Mm -hmm. So I think, well, I was very excited during the last show I was at, I got to hike into the canyon a bit. So oh. that, was, that was exciting. I was very proud of myself because art supplies are heavy. Um, when we did the, we did a river rafting trip in the canyon with some friends of mine, and that was all camping for about ten days, and that that was tricky because the terrain was not, you know, your friend. Right. But well, and your stuff's getting wet, probably. And the stuff stayed dry pretty well. They were it, able to tarp it up, but I think sand was the bigger problem. Nah. Sand, sand was the bane of your existence down there. I've never done the Grand Canyon trip. It's I think hiking it, though, is easier than yeah. rafting it. My, but that's my opinion. Yeah, but the, the other people are cooking all the food for you, right? Yeah, but you got to haul that stuff off the boat and on the boat every day. Oh. That's like, you get like a group of artists who have like two bags per person. There's always someone who carries way too much stuff. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what bag you bring. You're responsible for everybody's stuff. So everyone unloads everything. Everyone loads everything back up every day. So you're like, oh. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So there are people who will say um, painting is more than just representing what you see. What is painting to you? Well, like, I think for me it's like it's the challenge of trying to, to represent what I see, like my version of what I see. It doesn't have to be verbatim, but it's like an interesting color interaction or maybe there was the atmosphere or like a challenging view that you didn't know if you could quite get. I also think that what makes artists different than just you know a photographer is that we have the luxury of kind of editing it in a way they can't like you have this wonderful ability to kind of you know play your own form of God with what you see and Invent it a bit. You know, you want to be true to your subject, but you can shift that tree. Or maybe you want that sky to be a little bit of a different color. Like, we have that creative license, and that's a wonderful thing you can do with painting. Right. Well, and, I, and that's the point, isn't it? You're trying yeah. to do a painting, a piece of art. You're not necessarily trying to... Be literal. Be, be literal. And it's like that flash of a... You know, I think it's like... You're capturing like when the regular viewer like would say, let's come to the canyon and look, they'll look, but maybe they don't really look. Maybe what you're painting is what they take home in their mind's eye, like that's the painting you have. It's like that moment when you looked at it and maybe turned away and you missed something. Right. I think as artists we try to capture that little brief moment. Well, and we also get the opportunity to sit and stare at something for a few hours. Which is awesome. Yeah. You, you, it's surprising how much you miss when you don't do that. Yeah. So life just kind of goes by and you're like, ooh, look at that, look at that, look at that right. light right now. There's a scene in the movie Vacation with Chevy Chase <laughs> where they drive all the way across country to go to the Grand Canyon yeah. and they get there and they go, <laughs> and then they leave, right? That's like a lot of visitors there. It, it's a, a lot. And, they don't even get, sometimes they don't even get up to Tovar. They just stop at the first pullout and head back and it's like, oh gosh. You're missing so much. Now, have you been out on the, the thing, the Indian no, Reservation? No, I haven't. Where you, you walk I out? I don't think I can do that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's not a height thing. I'm very comfortable with heights, especially going there so much. But just like, I don't want to paint. I don't even know if it's a place I'd want to paint. Oh, it's spectacular. I did it um, 
I did it the first week they opened. Oh, you did? And that was expensive then, because I think they you paid for everything, like just to walk out. To oh, it's the... still expensive. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then you have to you can't take your camera, oh, take gosh. your shoes off. You oh, know, gosh. you have to pay for their photograph. See, I can't do that. I yeah, can't. but it really is worthwhile because it, you're, it's really interesting. I'll just to go see to Toro Weep and stand on the very edge and be like. I it's yeah. different though, there's something about your brain, even though psychologically yeah. you know I'm on something that's <laughs> stable. When you're able to look down through a glass floor, yeah. you're like, ugh. It's kind of fun. Yeah. But I did have that for the first times I went to the canyon, I did have that. There was this one part that you could walk out on at the North Rim. They, yeah. They've made it safer since, but there was a time when you just walk out and you're like, I don't know about this. You just try to balance. But you get that vertigo, but I, I've lost a little bit of that. Like unless I get really close to an edge. I'm pretty good. So do you, do you feel like the Grand Canyon is your muse? It's, uh, it's definitely my motivation. I'm like, muse sounds so like romantic, I guess. But yeah, I, I suppose so. I, 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 I haven't lost interest yet. There's so many different facets. Like you can paint the people, you can paint the mules, you can paint, you know, the river scenes or the tree scenes. It's like it's unlimited, and yet you still get to have a genre. Like, that's well, great. I had never painted the Grand Canyon until I took my kids out there a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I used gouache or something. I, <laughs> that that's sounds what I hard. Had, that's what I had with me. But I was blown away by how difficult it was because there's so much information. There is. It's easy to get lost in like an area, which I'm sure during the, the video I'll probably have parts where I'm like, where, where was I again? But you know, the, the thing that does help is it's almost like so abstract, your brain can't really, you know, for example, like if you paint a tree, you know, you grow up as a kid, you're like, trees are these green circles on brown sticks, green circle, brown stick, lollipop trees. Right. And you know, you have to unlearn that as an artist and paint what it really is, is maybe a green lumpy thing on a purple stick. Well, can, or like clouds, I mean, we, we you know. Yeah. Clouds are not white. No, but the canyon kind of like, you don't really go and paint the canyon like, oh, the canyon should look like this. And you're like, I don't know what this relates to. So it's one less thing you have to deal with is, you know, lollipop trees. Right. You're like, okay, well, let's just start from scratch. Abstraction, it's like blue patch, orange patch, sky. Right. So I like that about the canyon. I think yeah. it's. Well, it's a challenge and I think you know, the, it, it's so big and so many angles. I mean, you could stand in one spot and get a hundred paintings. Yeah. And so I would imagine it's something that is ever yeah, you challenging. you just paint, you just pivot, pivot the easel as you go. Right. You could do that. Right. So did you have a, uh, an inspiration, a favorite Grand Canyon painter from the past? Um, well, I mean, I, you know, Holings I mentioned definitely got, got me out there. I mean, I'm Did definitely... Did you ever meet him? No, I've never met him, no. Yeah, he, just, died, uh, he, uh, he died... He died a few years no, ago. A few years ago. And I was like, oh, rats. I mean, there's a lot of great canyon painters out there. I'm, I'm definitely a fan of, of Kurt Walters, I mean. I like, he has like, he's romantic, but he's not far away from the reality of the canyon, which I like. I, I kind of like the literal canyon. I'm not, I don't think I go too fanciful with it so I like his interpretation of it and how it looks so busy yet not I don't know I always thought that was great you know Woodforce I always have a hard time saying Gunnar Woodforce is like super cool I, I like the watercolors too I used to do that a lot more and so his stuff is really fun to see now you do watercolors as well don't you yeah mostly for studies like if I can't I, I enjoy doing them for fun because it's like it's my way of like I don't want it to be work. I, I love doing them. It's enjoyable. I can take them on trips and just, you know, take my little notebook out and just paint. And if it doesn't work out, I'm okay with that. If it looks great, I'm excited. But I like that they're low pressure and it's just where I get to be creative and enjoy myself. So, I mean, I, I don't know if I want to make a big watercolor again. Maybe I'll change my mind. I don't know. How big have you done? You've done big ones? When I was starting out, I, I, when I first started out, I was just pencil. I took the shoe fly class, and then I kind of went into watercolor, and that's all I did. But So then I would you know, maybe do 20 by 30s, and I was, I was young, so I was like, how creative can I be with watercolor? I would put saran wrap on things and salt and whatever I could put on it to give different <laughs> textures. 
Um, so now it's a little more simple. I'm, I'm having fun with just like puddling it so that the paint dries interestingly. Yeah, watercolor is about, oil painting is about application, like how you apply the paint to give it texture. It's like what counts. And watercolor, it's how you let it dry. It's like you're just kind of like, okay, what's it going to turn out like? I don't know. Right. It's uh, I, I, quite frankly, I think watercolor is harder than oil. But uh, that's just, I, I don't know if that's I really thought true. oil was super hot because, like, I had come from watercolor painting and then to go into oil painting because it was so flip-flop. Well, I, I, I had a similar reaction easy. in that, you know, watercolor is kind of where we all start out as kids. Yeah. And so we're a little more comfortable with it. But, but the one thing I realized about good watercolor is just they have to think about 50 steps ahead. They do. And you have to plot out because the know, water, you got to do everything before it dries. Otherwise, you, you get that worked paper look, and that's not good. Right. And, and with oil paint, if you mess it up, you just cover yeah. it. That is a luxury. So for somebody who might be viewing this who is just kind of getting into this and wanting to learn how to paint, what advice do you give them? What advice do you give your students? Um, I think products are important. I mean, I think... I, you know, just from my students in the past, there's a lot of this feeling like, well, because I'm new, I need to buy cheap supplies. And the problem with that is you're not going to get good results. Like, your red and blue will probably make brown. So that's the first thing you need to do. You're not going to feel successful if you can't properly mix a color. And I don't, you know, I think you want to start off on a right foot. So, you know, taking a good beginning class or understanding the basics, like, what, like maybe keep your palette simple. Don't go too crazy. Understand how paints work, how it mixes. Just have fun. Understand what the things you can do. Um, understand shadows and lights, and drawing. Go through some basic steps so that you can, you know, be successful. Don't try to bite off more than you can chew. Like if you haven't painted the Grand Canyon before, maybe that's not where you start. Do something simple and then feel good about that and then maybe move on to something harder and feel good about that and then move on. So. I think for myself, I definitely took things in baby steps. I, I felt good about my values before I started breaking into color. So, you know, I think what I like to go through is just painting is hard enough as it is, so make the process simpler. Like, give yourself more prep work so that you are more successful. Like, think, Amy, think. Yeah, you know, I'm blinking. <laughs> Sorry. So, I'm, I'm probably going to talk it all about, like, you know, I do the sketch and then I do. You know, a, I'll do a study and then I'll kind of sketch it out on the canvas. I'll pre-mix some colors because that takes one less thing out of the process when I'm painting. And then, you know, I try not to have to juggle too many things at once. Okay, so we, I'm sure you'll talk about that in the instructional, but essentially you'll make a pile of different colors that yeah. you're seeing. The main piles, mm-hmm. Yeah. I like to work with a gray palette or a neutral palette. I mean, it doesn't have to be gray, but... I try to avoid white because, for me, it's a lot easier to judge color on something neutral because... Your painting in the end, if we were to take all the colors and mix them together, would be a neutral mud. Well, plus when you're outdoors, white blows out your eyes. It does. It is really hard to see. So I'll even tone my canvas down. I mean, not everyone does that, and for a while I didn't, but I find it, I do better if it's toned. And so my goal is to find out what makes it easier for me to paint. Like, what am I going to have success with? What am I, what am I not going to have success with? Like which colors perform for me when I need them to? Which are the brushes that are gonna perform for me? What is the subject matter I'm gonna work with? Like, I'll do the sketches beforehand so that like, I know if it's even gonna work out. Well, it also helps you define, you know, when you're outdoors, there's so much information, you're glancing around, next thing you you're know, summing it up. Things, that are, things that are on the outside all of a sudden start creeping in, and yeah. it's nice to have that drawing to know. That is the hard this thing. This is my edge. It's, it's, it's 360 degree view. It's like all the way around and like it's hard to like bring everything in and you know, you'll see students that like get out there and they just paint the whole canyon. And it's like you got to okay, find your view and then like stick with this view. So the little sketch is a lot easier for us to come up with an idea on something that's small and then get the shape out. Okay, now I can work out with size. I'm going to be vertical. Is it going to be a square? And then, okay, well, this is a terrible sketch. Maybe I need to redo it or do a different subject you know you learn a lot about it doing those things and yeah well you know when, when you're doing a sketch you have something in your head and then when you try to do the sketch sometimes it just doesn't you're work. like well that's not a, yeah that's, you might discover something that's like well this is a flaw in this painting like 
Right. Or you'll, you'll note, like, okay, the, how, what, what's going to happen with the light in this subject? How long am I going to have it for? Like, when do I need to really bust it out? When do I need to slow down? Better to get it done first, early. Sketches so you help. Because yeah, <laughs> you really got the, the, the value study there, so you kind of know where the shadows are. So you, you're very young, and you have a lot of opportunity ahead of you. What's the big goal for you? What, what are the big things that you kind of dream of doing that you want to kind of check off your bucket list one day? Um, bucket list. I think career-wise, you know, I think when I first started out, they were more grandiose, and now it's just like, you realize how much you really need in life to be content, and I think the big goal for me is just to keep painting. I think anyone who's an artist and is painting full-time is a success, and to be able to keep doing what I do is a wonderful thing. So long-term goal is just to do what I do, not have to retire and just paint. Um, there's definitely a lot of places I want to paint. Like? I, well, okay, so the, my future trip I hope to go on is Chiapas, so that sounds very exciting. Uh, isn't, that where the, the, isn't that the other bigger canyon? They do have the big, yeah, the, the Grand Canyon of Mexico is somewhere down there. Yeah. But I think just like... The people like Mexico, I'll go and paint there sometimes, and it's just, it's a beautiful place. It's like, to go to like somewhere like San Miguel de Allende, it's like, it feels the Grand Canyon to me, because there's so much detail and color saturation and, you know, yellow ochres and reds, so. Where else would you like to go to paint? Um, I could go back to Italy, because I think there's some pretty buildings there. Um, we just went to Croatia over oh, the summer oh, nice. and that was exciting because yeah it's like a lot of stone walls I mean definitely I'm pretty happy with the canyon so I can always go back there and I will always go back there it's like an endless source of I haven't been to Toro Weeb yet I want to go see that it's Toro another Weeb. yeah that's another look it's on the east side oh no the west side east <laughs> so, west it's on the knows. west side of the canyon All right. um, it'd be also you know maybe one day I'll have a painting in the Grand Canyon that would be cool I mean, I have it at the studio every now and then, but... You mean their studio? They have an artist residency program? No, but sometimes they acquire artwork, so that would be pretty cool. If you're oh. a Grand Canyon painter and the Grand Canyon has a piece of your work, that's also pretty cool. One yeah, day. you know, if you go into the... What's the name <laughs> of the old hotel in the there's Grand There's El Tobar. Yeah, I have some friends in there. I'm like, hey, guys. Well, there's some beautiful they have historic some very, paintings yeah, oh, they in the do. lobby there. I and think they also got have a, like these. I think they have a Keith painting. They have some portables there too, which have an impressive art collection. But you have to find your way to go see them. So they have some really great works there. So it's it's cool. It's fun to see. Do you collect any other artists' works? Um, well, not much, but I do have some other works. I, I'm very proud of the few I have. It's very exciting. So I have like a watercolor from a teacher I had in college who passed away but I have it was it's a really pretty watercolor. Oh that's very special then. Yeah it was so I, I, I went to go see him before I went to that school to check out the art department but he was he was a neat guy. I have a painting by Susan Lyon so I took her workshop recently because it's still good to always take classes if you can just to mix things up but it was this, this little sketch of a girl and I just thought she was so pretty and you just I really am attracted to work that when I look at it, I think of like, okay, how, what can I learn from this? Like, how did she do that? Look at how subtle this stroke was to make the eye that isn't, you know, it's not literal, but it's just so nice and it feels literal. Um, do, you, do you find yourself going to museums when you travel and checking out the artwork? And oh, yeah, studying I do artwork? like museum visits. I probably, I don't really see everything and I'm not like the slow museum goer I'll kind of get to the the section I really like and then I'm just hooked like sergeant paintings Soroya paintings like I really want those sections because it's I feel like it's more like the stuff that inspires me so like the Spanish historical society is yeah. you just kind of want to touch it and take pictures the Soroya so you, you mean in, in New York at the Hispanic Society? Yes, yes, yeah, that was a the, great all the museum. Soroya paintings. So it was wonderful when I was in Paris. We went to Giverny and they happened to have him there. Oh, no, it was Zorn. Is it Zorn or Soroya? Gosh, I should know this. But they were there for the exhibit and I just thought it was awesome. A couple of years ago, we took the Fine Art 
Connoisseur Art Cruise in Spain. And so you got to see like... We, it turned out, just by luck of the draw, there were five different Sororia shows what? in different cities. So we got to, we got to just see all this great Sororia work. Yeah, there was one called you... Sororia and the Sea, and then there was the big <laughs> show that His traveled from San Diego and other places, and they had paintings in that that was that that's that one show they made the book out of right yes oh yes that was great and they had paintings in that show. that did not come to the u.s oh. show because they were from cuba and there's yeah. this trade embargo thing so we got to see the cuban paintings and uh there was it's just like a soroya fest it was wonderful Those are then hard, we went, like... went to his house and Oh, that would have been fun. Yeah, and you can't, like, it's hard to buy the books for those things because then you see them in person, and then you're like, I can't buy this book. I'm going to forget what it really looked like. But they did a good book for that show, and yeah. it's, like, spot on. So Yeah, the problem is taking all these heavy art books when you're traveling. You know, you spend a lot yeah. of money getting them home. Well, I, I got mine on online. I paid a lot for it, I guess. Like, someone was like, oh, if you get over here, it's, like, half the price. I was like, darn it. Well, I think that's important for students to understand that the more they can surround themselves with art... Yeah. The and no, the art books study. are not always the correct colors. No, no, they're Those are scary not. days when you get to the museum, like, wait, like, that, there was a Saroya painting where the women are working on the sail, and I thought it was a yellow gold painting. I t and I remember trying to paint it, and I saw it in person, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is completely different. The book had all the wrong colors, and right. that was like, oh my gosh, that was hard, those, those light bulb moments. So, of all the historic painters that you love, which one would you want to have dinner with, and what would you ask them? Yeah, Saroy is definitely up there. Like, ask him. Ooh, no, Sergeant, Sergeant. Oh my gosh. His watercolors of Venice were stunning. Or just some of those things. There's a new, Can I have dinner with both of them? Yeah, you together. Okay, uh, that would a, work. <laughs> there's a new Sargent watercolor show coming oh, up. I just good. had uh, tea in London with Sargent's um, grandnephew. I would like to be Sargent's granddaughter. That would be pretty cool. It's a good last name. <laughs> but yeah, they, they would be so fun. That L.A. show of his work was like really exciting to see. Like how he would just play so neutral and then have like a shock of purple as a fan. So he'd be like, whoa, how do you do that? Right. And like, I don't even know what question I would ask because I feel like I wouldn't, I just wouldn't know. Like it's, it, they're so out of my league, I would be asking the wrong one. I could say, what's your color palette? Or how do you, like I always marveled at how like Sergeant could, you know, have just a wall of like, I'm not very good at this. It was just nothing. Like it would just be a blank, simple, like, you know, color washed in wall, but it would look exciting. I have this urge that I need to fill up every corner. So canyons work for me because it's just like detail everywhere. So I can just detail, 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 like noodle around to death and it works. And they're so good at like, I think because they're so different from me, I really, I want that, like that just clean. The negative space is awesome. That they, that, that simple negative space, is that how I would phrase it? Just like that wash of color. Right. And that still looks like all sorts of stuff are happening. Like, how do you do that? How do you let those things happen? Well, it sounds to me like uh, you're very passionate. You're still growing. You're, you're still experimenting. And uh, what's the big painting, like the one you want to most be remembered for, that you haven't done yet? It would, it would be a canyon scene. I think something that would be like my, my ideal day if I went out there, it would be like maybe just before, just after a storm when you get like that kind of spotlight mood lighting, maybe a little snow in there and maybe some like some of that cloud inversion, like mm. that kind of day. Mm. And then it would be a, just a big piece. How big? really good footage. I think the biggest I've done was like 60 inches across, so like bigger than that. A couple feet. Something that could be like, you know, maybe like, wouldn't it be fun to do something like, well, I probably would get there and say 15 feet, but I could do 10 feet. I think I'd need a new easel. Like 10 feet by like yeah, I'll tell you what, if you do, a, feet. you do a 10 footer, I'll buy you a new I'm, easel. <laughs> I knew, yeah, I got, I got myself a huge easel, which is like brilliant. Like I, I won a prize and the first thing I did was I, I bought that easel 
and it's like, I don't know if it's the right term, but it's like the one prong. So it's the smallest one that goes in all the different directions. But like, oh, now I'm like, why didn't I get one with two of them? Because I, I didn't think I would ever go bigger than a... Back then, I thought a 16 by 20 was like giant. And now like... Well, you know, maybe somebody bigger. watching this will commission you to do a 10-foot painting. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Still yeah. probably. I have some, some work to do. So once I get those like commissions done, I'm going to be cranking out a big one. Well, one of the I'll, things I'll that I, when, when I teach marketing, one of the things I tell all artists is that you need to paint bigger. Yeah. Because um, most of the paintings in museums are bigger. And There's always, everyone has these walls that are just huge and they don't know what to do with them. And they don't want like 20 little pieces all over it. So. Right. And, and nobody's ever going to throw out a 10 foot painting. It's fun too, because when you do the big paintings, I had another teacher mention this once, and I'm like, that's so true. Like the bigger the painting is, like when you're the artist and you're painting it, you kind of feel like you're in it. You're in the middle of it. It feels like you're there. And that's something that a large painting brings to you. Is you, you know, a little one, they're, they're gems, but the big ones, it's like, I could be here, you know, if right. I get up like right like that close enough. I haven't done it myself, but you know, one day I'm going to do the 10 foot painting. Just I, I bought a 10 foot roll of canvas. I go to stretch. Can, it. Is there like a 10 foot challenge that Facebook does? We can do like you know, oh, an ice bucket challenge. Can we do the 10 foot? What a great idea! Challenge? We'll do the 10 foot challenge. <laughs> Month yeah. later, it'd be the slowest challenge ever because it takes so long to do every painting. It'd be Results like, would be like okay hey, next year. Six months later. Yeah. <laughs> six months later, I finished. So you're young, but how do you want to be remembered? In, in terms of when the history books are written and when people are talking about you long after you're gone, what do you hope they say about you as an artist? Like the artist's artist. Yeah, that's, that's the place to be. Like it's not so much that, you know, you were the most popular, you were like whatever, but to have your peers look at you and say like, oh, she was a good painter. She knew what she was doing. She, she was the artist's artist. And I don't, think I'm there, but who doesn't want to, you know, you don't, I don't want to be looked at as like, oh, she sold out, she did all this, and I'm like, yeah, there's a balance to all that things, you got to find a balance, but to know, like, the artist thought you were a good painter. Well, and isn't that oh, always nice. the, you know, when you're in a show, mm -hmm. at, at the Artist Choice Award, that the consumers never pick the painting that no. is the one that would be the artist choice. That's why you say but, the artist artist. But when yeah. you're the artist choice award, you know that's a really big accomplishment. That's always something that I was interested in. I think when it comes to judging shows, like sometimes I think that the truest award is the artist choice award. Because sometimes when it comes to people's choice, you know, I mean, sometimes someone might have a giant group of friends that come. So it's hard to tell. Like, sometimes it's genuine. Sometimes you just never know. But, like, when the artists are voting, it's, it is a different situation. Because they're like, I know how this person works. They know that artist. They know what they do. They can appreciate, you know, the subtle strokes they did and the decisions they made in their painting from a different point of view. That you're like, oh, like, you know... the. I bought a painting at the Grand Canyon show, and that was that was my favorite piece at the event. And I don't know if anyone else liked it, but I marveled at the way it was. Um, Bob Delgowski, so he did a watercolor well from inside the canyon, like the way he did the dry brush and he used the watercolor medium was like fascinating. So it's like he wasn't popular artist choice, but he was my favorite. Well, well he was the popular artist. <laughs> it's like getting us all wrong. I thought he was amazing. Like, he was like, that's an artist. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. That's Amory Bowling and Seascape Painting Secrets, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount in the comments section. Thanks for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. The Sea. The sea has been inspiring artists since the beginning of time. Artists like Turner, Sargent, Monet, and Sorolla. Seascapes are magical scenes, a true testament to nature's wonder, and full of limitless opportunity for beginner and experienced painters alike. They say that an artist has arrived when he or she has mastered the sea. That's why great seascape painters never go hungry.
in the all-new Seascape Painting Secrets Video Training Collection. Master Painter Amory Bowling guides you through the step-by-step -step process of painting a gorgeous seascape. If you're tired of seascapes lacking life and emotion, or if you've never tried it, now you can get it right from the beginning, without the awkward struggle of trying to chase moving waves and water. It's always better to paint with me than to just watch. I mean, there's a lot of information I'm giving out to you and I want you to be able to commit this to memory. So we're gonna be providing an image for you. You can take a photo of it. You're also able to do a screenshot. However, you can get it off of this video you're watching and into some kind of a tangible object that you can set next to you and work with me. So you can have a video playing and you can have your reference material just like I do. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you know, you're gonna be able to get some of the ideas at least working with me, it's going to help this stuff really set in and stick like glue. You'll discover the secrets to painting sand, rocks, crashing and rolling waves, and reflections on the water. Tips and tricks to working with light and shadow. So if I were to have a scale like this, let's say my dark is here, right? And let's say my white is here. Let's say this is the middle point where there's no man's land. All your shadows are gonna be in this side. All your lights are gonna be in this side. Amory will not only show you the step-by-step -step process of a painting from beginning to end, she will demonstrate small steps that give you a big advantage. This is gonna tease that area. Very light-handed brushwork. I'm using the point like this. as opposed to when I was scrubbing the water and I'm taking this side of the brush and I'm just scrubbing it in like this. And then sometimes you'll see me do this when I want to be really like square about my brush shape. It's not just about painting what you see. It's about creating the emotion you feel when you visit the sea and how to capture that in your painting. Amory Bowling is a talented instructor with a gift for breaking down the painting process so that it's both easy and fun. You'll have hours of enjoyment, and knowing these techniques will make your seascape paintings come alive. You could spend decades and hundreds of hours trying to master the sea, or you can let Amory Bowling share what took her years to learn. Seascape Painting Secrets is now available on DVD and streaming video. Order yours today and start painting amazing seascapes tomorrow.